grammar gumshoes. On this show, we investigate, and I hope solve, your English mysteries. And tonight we have some fascinating questions to solve, some fascinating enigmas to unravel. So I'm happy to have you with me, and we'll get started in a few moments. But to kick things off, I'd love to hear from you guys and uh, find out where you're watching from. So say hello in the comment thread and tell me what country you're watching in. And we'll see who's with us. I think we have already a few viewers joining us. We have Suwon. We have Marta. We have Levi. So we have Malaysia, I think. We have Greece. We have Brazil. Uh, we have UAE. Uh, Tesfalem is with us from UAE. Welcome, welcome. Great to have you all here. Hopefully you're all doing well, studying your English, learning grammar, getting confused by grammar, and getting unconfused by grammar as we uh, work through it together. Now, occasionally you may notice my voice cracking up, and that's because I've been suffering from a bit of a cough lately, and it's changing my voice. So occasionally I might have to get a sip of water to clear my throat, but uh, I'll try to get through the show without cracking up and sounding ridiculous. Um, we have a couple of English mysteries to deal with tonight that have been sent to us on previous shows, including one that um, somebody asked me last week, and I couldn't find that person in any of my social media network, so I couldn't tell them that I will tell you, I will explain their question tonight. Um, so hopefully they join us and we can catch up. But it was a question related to the word so. We'll get to that shortly. Um, oh, we have Teacher Jack with us from the A to Z English podcast. If you don't, if you are not familiar with that podcast already, you should check it out. Uh, Jack, feel free to put the link to your podcast in the comment thread and share it with our friends, um, some of whom are in our WhatsApp community, but not everyone. Uh, so it's great to have you here with us, Jack. And hopefully you can join my show again in the future as a guest. That would be great, or a co-host. I had a great time the last time you joined the show, or I think that was last autumn. Um, so we're going to get started in a few minutes with our first English mystery. But there's a couple things I wanted to mention today. Um, just things that pop up during the week, working with my students and uh, Grammar Gumshoes WhatsApp group, sometimes I notice some things and they don't take long to talk about. I just want to get my little list here, make sure I've got the right ones. Um, where was it now? There was something that popped up this week I wanted to talk about. Huh. I can't seem to find it. Anyway, uh, we'll get to those topics eventually. Yeah, there are so many little grammar mysteries that I come across every day working with my students and clients and friends on WhatsApp. And I try to make a note um, so that I can use them on the next show. And sometimes I make the note and sometimes I completely forget to as things get going quickly. So... I think I haven't made the note on those things this week. Huh, interesting. Yeah, something came up that I thought was really worth sharing. Sometimes somebody will ask me a question and I'll give them the answer on WhatsApp because I want them, I want to help them out right away. But I also think sometimes those questions can also help others on the show. So um, I want to remember to address them again on the next show. And sometimes I forget to write them down. Hmm, we'll get to that another time. Well, in that case, I think we should probably jump right in and look at our first English mystery of the night. So, the first thing I want to talk to you guys about tonight um, is this topic. So I'm going to just introduce it and we'll get into business in a moment. Okay, so here we go. English Mystery of the Week. Okay. 
Okay, so this is uh, an interesting topic somebody asked me about in the WhatsApp community. And I initially I thought, well, I could share a link to one of my videos about modals. Somebody asked me about modals. I think they asked me this question. Uh, something like this. How to use should, could, can, might, etc. What's the difference? Um, and this person, you know, has obviously seen these words used, but isn't sure what they mean, how to use them in a sentence, and so on. So today I want to talk about these words, and these words belong to a category of word called modals. Now, we'll get to that in a second. Um, one of the confusion, uh, there's a lot of confusion about these words, and there's a couple of reasons why. One, these words in textbooks are often called modal verbs. Modal verbs. I have a problem with that word, that name, because it suggests that a modal verb is a kind of verb. And that suggests that we don't need a normal verb, that we can use a modal verb, which suggests we could make a sentence like this. I should... the dinner. I should the dinner. That's a modal verb, so we can use it as a verb, right? No. I, subject, should, modal, dinner, object, we still need a real verb. So, you can't use a modal instead of a verb. It has to work with a verb. So, I don't actually even like calling them modal verbs. I think that's a misleading name. And I think that's where a lot of confusion begins for learners, because textbooks by native speakers and teachers say modal verb. So I'm not going to call them modal verbs, because I don't want you to be confused. Instead, I'm going to call them modals. Simply modals. Okay, and let's look at a kind of working definition here. A modal is an auxiliary verb. So it's a helping verb. Okay? It's not a regular verb. It's not an action. It's not a state. It has to work with another verb, like all auxiliaries. Auxiliary verbs are helpers, and they help the main verb. And auxiliary is a big category, and some regular verbs act as auxiliaries. So auxiliary just means helper. And what does it do? A modal is an auxiliary that expresses the speaker's attitude, opinion, or assessment of the main verb's action. This is really important, guys. This is the meaning of modals. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what I'm talking about here, and we'll come back to this title card. So let me make a, a sentence here. Um, The, ah, I'm just going to change that. Let's look at this sentence. She ran in the park. In fact, Let's change that to simple present. She runs in the park. That kind of sentence is a simple statement, right? We have a subject, a verb, and a preposition phrase that tells us where she does the action, right? It's kind of adverbial. Very simple sentence. She runs in the park. This is what we call a statement. It's not a question. I'm not asking, does she run in the park? I'm saying she runs in the park every day, every evening, whatever. It's her habit. It's her hobby. It's her routine, right? Simple present means routine, habit, or general fact. This is a fact. This is something I have seen. Every day I see her running in the park. So I know it's true. It's a fact. It's a statement. It's an observation. 
It's not my opinion. It doesn't tell you how I feel about this fact. This is a fact. If you look at the park every day, you will see her. It's a fact. It's not my opinion. But we can have opinions about this, about this fact. You could ask me, Paul, how do you feel about that fact? She runs in the park every day. Do you think that's good or bad? And I can give you an opinion. I'm the speaker. And how do we do that? How do we change that into opinion? This is just a statement of fact. I'm not telling you that this is good or bad. I'm just saying that every day she runs in the park. I'm not saying anything value about this. I'm not saying a positive value or a negative value, right? I'm not sharing my opinion about the fact, but I can. And modals allow me to do that, okay? Let me give you another example and we'll start using modals. Let's say we have a diligent grammar gumshoe student and he studies in the library. He studies in the library every afternoon after class. Just a fact. It's not good. It's not bad. No opinion. It's just a fact, an observation. Okay. Now, I told you a moment ago that a modal, oops, yeah, here we go, is an auxiliary that expresses the speaker's attitude or opinion or assessment. Assessment meaning deciding if it's good or bad, positive or negative, of the main verb's action. So this is not a simple statement. Once you use modals, you change the simple fact Where is it now? There we go. If we use a modal, we can change a simple fact into an opinion or an attitude. For example, let's use a modal. Now, when you use modals, here's a rule. And this rule works all the time. This is a 100% rule. It's consistent. And not all grammar rules in English are consistent. Some of them have a lot of uh, exceptions. This one doesn't. When you use a modal, the verb loses tense. No tense, no past, no present perfect, no present, no future. We change it to base form. Or sometimes that's called bare infinitive. It's the infinitive, infinitive verb. For example, to study is the infinitive. And if you take away the to and just say study, that's the base form or the bare infinitive. Bare is like naked. It has no to. Okay? So when you have a modal, the verb changes to base form or bare infinitive form. No choice if you use a modal every time. And it doesn't even matter if the modal is right beside it because sometimes we ask a question, we'll put the modal first. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, and our subject was he. He studies in the library every day, but now I wanna share you my opinion. And I'm gonna use probably the most common modal Should. Okay? He should study in the library. Now, when you're learning modals, you should know every modal has a meaning and it expresses that attitude or opinion of the speaker, whoever says that sentence, whoever writes it or whoever speaks it. Okay? What does should mean? Should means 
he should study in the library, it means this action is a good idea, in my opinion. So for example, hey guys, we have an exam tomorrow and Bob isn't doing well in the class. His grade is pretty low. So I think it's a good idea tonight he should study in the library. If he does, he might have a better result on the test. It's a good idea. Now, he might or might not. That's another modal we'll look at in a second. But I'm not telling you that he has no choice. I'm not telling you that it's a rule. I'm not saying that if he doesn't, he's going to jail. I'm just saying, in my opinion, because he has a test tomorrow, it's a good idea if he does this. He should study in the library. This is advice. Okay? In my opinion, this action is a good idea. It's, a, it's going to have a nice result, a positive result. Okay? It's not necessary. It's not obligation. I'm just saying, this is a good idea. That should. Let's look at another modal that you are familiar with. Will. Will is a modal. And you guys know this. We use will to express our ideas about the future. He will study in the library tonight. Now, do I know the future? No, I'm a human being. I don't know the future 100%, but I can guess about it. I can imagine the future, and therefore I need grammar to express what I can imagine. I can imagine that if I look in the library tonight, he will be there. It's a prediction, a guess about the future. If I see clouds in the sky, especially in my city, if I see clouds in the sky, I think, yeah, it will rain tomorrow. Now, it's not my plan. I don't know for a fact tomorrow's future, right? Nobody does. We can only guess about the future. The future doesn't exist yet, and we don't control it 100%. But we can guess about it, and that's the modal will. It's a prediction about the future. Now, it's my prediction. He will study in the library. Maybe his friend says, no, he won't. He hates studying. You will never see him in the library. But it's my opinion. I think he will because he knows he has a test tomorrow. So I think, I guess, that tonight he will study in the library. So this sentence expresses my feeling about this action. It's not a fact anymore. Remember we started with he studies in the library every day. That's a fact. This is not a fact. This is my guess about the future. Just my guess, or whoever wrote that. Let's look at another modal, another very common modal that you are familiar with. Can. Can expresses ability. Ability. Okay? It expresses the fact or the idea that he can study in the library. I don't know if he will, but he has the ability. So what, does you, what do you need to have the ability to study in the library? Well, you need a library pass. Some libraries have a security gate, so he needs a student pass. He needs probably his textbooks or his laptop or his iPad. Right? He needs his study material in his backpack. Maybe he needs water because if he's there for a long time, he needs to drink or coffee or tea. What else do you need to study? You need your supplies, your study materials, the books, the textbooks, the papers you have to look at. If you have those, you have the ability to study. You also, of course, need a library. If the library is closed, you don't have the ability. Okay? So if I'm looking at my friend Bob, let's give this guy a name. Bob. Bob's a student. Bob can study in the library. I don't know if he will. I'm just saying he has the ability. He can study in the library. It's possible. He has the ability. 
And by the way, some textbooks will tell you that this means possibility. I want to be careful with this. At its heart, can means ability. Naturally, though, if you have the ability to do something, then it's possible that you can do it. So we need to understand that this most clearly expresses ability, but ability leads to possibility, right? If he can study in the library, it's possible that he will, right? And you see how modals work like this. They can lead to the next thing. If he can study in the library, it's possible that in the future he will. It's also possibility, possible in the future that he will not. So ability and possibility are linked. But at the core, can means ability. Now, I've already used this word, but let's use, let's use it in a sentence and let's look at the meaning. Might. Bob might study in the library tonight. Well, now, what does that mean? Well, it means possibility. Remember I said this means ability. Well, this means possibility. Well, if I think, and remember, this is my opinion, not a fact. Bob might study in the library. That's not a fact. That's an opinion. One way to test, by the way, if something is a fact or an opinion, if, if it's an opinion, somebody else could believe the opposite. So test it. Is it possible to believe the opposite? Bob might not study in the library? Yes, it's possible. It's not a fact. Okay? Facts you can't argue against. They exist and they are true, if it's a real fact. Now, what does might mean? It means possible. Now, for it to be possible, it has to be able as well. So ability leads to possibility, but if you just want to express possible, possibility, use might. Bob might study in the library. There's like 50% chance. 50% possibility, right? 50% possibility that he might study in the library. I don't know. It's a kind of guess. Or maybe he told me he might. Hey, Bob, what are you doing tonight? Oh, I don't know. I might study. I might go to the, the sports game. So, 50% chance. Might, might not. Now, there is another modal that basically means the same thing. And you know this one too. May. May also expresses possibility. I'm going to put these together because their meanings are basically the same. But there are a few specific uses that might be different. Okay? But the, these are grouped as the same meaning, might, may. He may study in the library, he may not. Okay? That's my opinion. That's how I feel about this possibility. Uh, he might study in the library. I saw him with a backpack full of textbooks. And he was walking in the direction of the library. So my thought is, he might study in the library. Okay? Now, there are a few other modals that we should think about, but I want to say also that these are the most common because they express some really basic things that we use all the time. Now, there's another one related to should, and this is shall. And this is interesting because, actually, I'm going to put this separately. It shares a lot of meaning with should right? But uh, it also has this meaning of like, shh. I, this is the way I like to remember it. The shh part means should, and the al part, or the ll, means will. So it's kind of a mix of should and will, meaning something that you shall do in the future is a good, ide good idea. It's a good thing to do. And it's often used in questions. Hey, shall we go to the movie? I think it's a good idea. What do you think? Shall we? It's often used in questions. I also want to say it's not all that common. It's more common in the UK, where I live in Canada and probably in the US, where Jack is from, who's watching us, I think. Shall is not often used. 
um, it might be more used in questions only, right? Okay, that's shall. Now we have to look at a couple of other ones. <clears throat> Must. Must. Bob must study in the library. Why? Why must he? Must means certainty. He has no choice. He must study in the library. Why? He has a test tomorrow. And his grades are kind of low. If he doesn't study, he might fail tomorrow's exam. And if he fails the exam, he fails the class. Now, <clears throat> So must is like, this is really certain. This is a ne necessary. But it's still my opinion, right? I think he must study because I'm a teacher, right? I think he must study. It's my opinion. He doesn't really must. Must he? Will he live or die if he does not study? Probably not. Will he go to jail if he doesn't study? No. He just might fail the exam. So in the context of the exam tomorrow, we can say it's really, really necessary that he study if he wants a good grade. If he doesn't want to pass the test, who cares? If Bob doesn't care about his grades, who cares? He does not must study in the library. He doesn't must. Must doesn't apply. It's just my opinion, right? I think he must study because I've seen his grades and they're not that good. Okay? That's what must means. Must do something is really necessary in the speaker's opinion. That's my feeling about that action. Bob might have a different view. Okay? So remember, modals don't express facts. They express the speaker or the writer's attitude or opinion, right? Let's go back to that graphic. Oh, I seem to have lost it. Where the heck is it? Huh. Let's bring it back. This is our working definition of a modal. An auxiliary that expresses the speaker's attitude, opinion, or assessment of the main verb's action. Right? So, the main verb's action is study, and my attitude about that action is, yeah, he must study. Right? My assessment is, this is necessary. I've seen your grades, Bob. They're not good. So, if you want to pass the course, you have to pass the exam tomorrow, so you must study because I know that you don't really understand our topic, so you must study. Bob can also say, nah, teacher, don't care. I don't want to study because I don't want to pass. So this is expressing the speaker's attitude, not a fact. Even if we're talking about an action like um, a law, right? Like we could say, we must pay taxes. Hey, we must pay taxes. It's necessary. <clears throat> yes, if you want to avoid trouble with the government. But you can also choose not to pay taxes. Y you know, there's nothing in your life really stopping you. Just don't pay them. Now, you might get in trouble. That's your choice. So it's not a fact that we must pay taxes. It's my attitude. Now, it's a very strong necess necessity, and I don't want trouble with my government, so I pay my taxes. But actually, it's not a statement of fact. It's a statement of opinion. That's why we use modals. Okay, there's a couple more to look at. Now, these are what some are sometimes called semimodals because they use another word. They use the um, preposition to. Need to. <clears throat> we need to pay taxes. Okay, and obviously the word need expresses necessity. Necessary. Something is necessary. Right? 
So, need to. We need to pay taxes. Bob needs to study. Now, you'll see what I just did there. Bob needs to. You have to apply the S to this modal. It's a little different. That's why we call it a semimodal. And the same kind of change applies to this one. Have to. We have to pay taxes. So again, this expresses necessity. Okay? And it's a semimodal. So when we use I have to, we have to, but if we use she or he, this must be has to. She has to pay taxes. He has to. They have to. Okay? So these semimodals change and conjugate with the subject. That's a little weird and it's confusing. Um, and again, these express necessity, in your opinion. And if you're not comfortable changing them, you can always use must, right? Now there's a less common one, but we should know it. And that's ought to, ought to, ought to, ought to. We ought to pay taxes. And this one, this semimodal is different because it doesn't change with he ought to, I ought to, they ought to, she ought to pay taxes. Bob ought to study in the library. Now this one <clears throat> is far more common in the UK. And maybe it's a little bit old fashioned. People do use it in North America. It's just less common. But you will hear it and you will read it. So it's good to know. All right. Now, there are two more that you are familiar with, and I'm leaving them for the end because they are problematic. They cause confusion. But they are modals, and they do act like these other modals do, so they are worth examining. And they are... <coughs> could... Uh, and would. Do I have another one? Where's my magnets? Here we go. Could and would. You're familiar with those. And I think you know that we use these with conditional grammar, right? In fact, my belief is that all the different ways we use these two words are all conditionals. For example, if we make a polite request, we use one of these. We might say, could you please open the door? Or would you help me? That is actually an implied conditional because what you're saying is, could you open the door if you're able, if it's convenient for you, right? It's polite because you give the other person the option of saying, no, it's not convenient. It's not possible. That's giving them the power to say no. That's what makes it polite. They are, they are conditional in their meaning. Would. Uh, I would like a cappuccino. That's a request. It's also a conditional. I would like a cappuccino if it is possible. If your restaurant has them. If you don't mind bringing me one. The person can always say, sorry, we don't sell cappuccinos. So until you know that they can give you a cappuccino, it's conditional, right? It's not necessarily going to happen. The point here is, these are modals, which means after you use them in any way, the verb is in base form or bare infinitive, always. Um, even when we use them in a question like, would you open the door? Would you bring a cappuccino? Could you help me, right? The verb is in bare infinitive form. So they're modals. They act like modals. They are modals. I wanted to put these last because a lot of textbooks and probably a lot of teachers tell students that could is the past tense of can or would is the past tense of will. I don't like that idea. I think that explanation is very confusing. Here's why. We started this conversation by me telling you that 
I don't like calling these modal verbs because that suggests that we don't need a real verb. We do. Modals work with a main verb, always. You can't use this without a main verb. So these are an auxiliary that changes our attitude about the verb. But they're not a verb, and therefore they can't express tense. This verb expresses tense, right? So it's not really true that would is the past tense of will, right? But I know, it, I know the idea, what it's trying to tell you. Because this has to be in base form, we can't change that to past tense. So how do we express that this was my opinion about the past? Well, we use the would form, the conditional form, because the past is conditional, right? Bob would study in the library if we were in the past, right? So it sort of indirectly, indirectly signals the past because the verb can't when you use a modal. But it's not really the past tense of will because these modals are not verbs that express tense. They don't really, they're not really verbs. So they can't really express tense, but they can signal it, right? Because the verb can't when we use these together. So would and could, they're also very common. And like can, I mean, they're related. I'm just telling you that they're not exactly past tense, but they are related in meaning. We said can was ability. Could is an ability. It's a conditional ability, right? Uh, would is expressing um, prediction of what, about what is going to happen, what will happen in the future, what would happen in the future if something else was, were true, right? For example, if I had a million dollars, I would buy a Ferrari, possibly, in the future. Maybe in one hour after the show, maybe tomorrow, right? So it's in the future, that's why it's related to will, but it's conditional. I need a million dollars, don't have it, so there's no Ferrari in my future. Okay, so <clears throat> let's review this. We have the subject, we have the modal, and the modal is always in front of the verb, and the verb is always in base form or bare infinitive. And each modal expresses a different meaning to help us express the speaker's opinion about the verb, right? We should pay taxes. It's a good idea because then you don't get in trouble with the government. And you could also say we should pay taxes because our taxes help our society. You can argue one way or the other about that politically, but personally, I believe that. I believe we should pay taxes. It's a good idea because we get a good result. In my country, we get a good result with those taxes. Okay? Bob will study in the library, I think. That's my guess about the future. Will is a prediction about the future, and that's my opinion about the future. Bob can study in the library. I don't know if he will, but he can. He has what he needs. He has his books, he has his iPad, he has some coffee, the library is open, he has a library pass, it's possible. He has the ability. Uh, might or may, yeah, because he has the ability, he might study in the library tonight. He might, he might not. He may study in the library, he may not. We shall pay taxes, right? So that's a mix of should and will. We shall pay taxes next month. Or shall we pay taxes? Is it a good idea that we do that together? I don't know. We must pay taxes. If we don't pay taxes, our society will suffer. We need to study in the library if we want to pass the test. <clears throat> we ought to, sorry, we have to study in the library if we want to pass the test. We could also study at home. So we don't really have to study in the library. It's just my opinion, right? We ought to pay taxes. I think it's a good idea. Ought is the same idea as should, same meaning as should. Uh, we could pay taxes if we wanted. And if 
We don't want trouble from the government. We, or let's say Bob, would pay taxes if he had money. But Bob spent all his money on school, so he has no money for taxes, so he's in trouble. Those are modals. <clears throat> Hopefully that clears up that question, and the original question was um, about all these different modals. Where are we? Yep. Yeah. So somebody had asked me about these different modals. Right? What's the difference? Well, the differences are the meanings. We use them in the same order, in the same structure of a sentence. They're all modals. The modals have one structural position before the base verb. But each one expresses a little bit something different. Right? Do you guys have any questions about this? Let me back up. I've been talking for a while. I'm just going to grab a little water with my trusty Grammar Detective mug, which are available if you'd like. Um, let's see if I've missed some questions about this. I'll also just say hello to a few people that joined us a bit late. We have Fatih. We have Facebook user. When you watch inside a Facebook group, I cannot see your name, so I don't know who this is. Ah, it's Chris from Brazil. Great. We have Karen watching from South Korea, Busan. Great. Nice to have you with us, Karen. Ah, oh, this is Jack saying hello to Karen. Jack, meet Karen. Karen, meet Jack. Uh, Karen was a guest on my show last year. She's a fellow English instructor, editor, uh, fabulous guest on the show. Uh, so if you can, go to my YouTube channel and check out that interview. And hopefully we'll have her back on the show again. We have with us also Sitara Sitara. Great. Uh, and Sitara is from Pakistan. Welcome. And Marta says, modals are a pain in the neck. I love using them, but when I did my CELTA, I would see different information in several books. So my teacher trainer wouldn't accept some theories out there. This is one of the big challenges in learning from learning English. Different textbooks, different teachers tell you different things, right? We have different terms for the same thing, depending on the textbook. Some textbooks are made in Canada, some are made in the US, some are made in the UK. They all use different language about language, and sometimes it's difficult to know which one to choose. I've studied all those different textbooks, and my opinion is from all the different terminology, I try to select the one that is best and clearest for my students. For example, I don't like to call these modal verbs because I don't think that's helpful for my students. I want you guys to think of these as just modals. We still need a real verb. If we start calling these modal verbs, sometimes students will forget to use a main verb because their teacher told them this is a modal verb, so all we need is a modal verb, right? We can say, Bob should in the library. Bob should what? We still need a verb. We always need a verb. If you don't have a verb, you don't have a sentence. So, um, in my years of studying grammar books and English learning textbooks, I've had the same problem. There are so many different ideas and words and terms it's ridiculous. But you're a teacher, and you get to present your English topics the way you want them. So for, in my case, I call these modals, not modal verbs. My students, I think, benefit from that because it, it removes a little confusion. And that's my goal. My goal is for the learner to learn. I don't care if I'm following the specific Cambridge instruction or the specific school instruction that I work at. That's not important to me. What's important to me is that you guys learn. So whichever way is the best for your students to learn, that's what I would suggest. I would suggest you develop your own approach to things based on all the different stuff you've learned. And I would also say it's good to learn from several different sources and then develop your own way of presenting that information, right? Some people have kindly said they like the way I present grammar. I appreciate that. That's, that's lovely. And some people have asked me, 
you know, what method do I follow or what uh, system do I follow? Is it Celta? Is it Delta? Is it Belta? I, I develop my own based on all these different sources, right? And the experience I've had working with students in language schools. I've developed my own approach. Now, I can't, I can't start calling this something else like subject, uh, I don't know, spheres. They're modals. We need a recognizable word. Um, but there is a lot of room for you to adjust how you approach these topics. We have Luis with us. Luis, welcome, welcome. Yeah, Jack, glad you pointed that out. Um, Jack is in Korea, but he's originally a teacher in the U.S. And yeah, shall is not that common in North America. Sometimes I actually like using it as a question when I'm talking to a group. Hey guys, shall we go? It, I think it's nice to use it as a question, but we could also just say, hey, let's go, right? Oh, that's very kind. And again, Suwon, if you like my explanation, it's because I've tried all the other ones, right? I've followed the textbook guides all kinds of different ways on students. So a lot of what I do is from trial and error and experience working with students and teaching grammar points in a certain way and seeing one of two looks on my students' faces. One is like, oh, yeah, I get it. The other is like, huh? We don't want huh. We want aha. I get it. And so when you teach something and somebody gets it, Remember how you taught it and repeat that. This is a great question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, I think I said it earlier, ought to and shall, they're not that common in Canada and probably not in the US. They're a little more common in the UK. Uh, but I always teach it because you're going to encounter this, it, whether it's in watching a movie or reading a book. Um, it's good to know, right? And also if you're writing something or saying something and you have to use should, 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 should over and over again, it's nice to put in ought to once in a while just to add a little variety. Uh, as for the contraction, well, most of my teaching now actually is focused on writers. I work with student writers. And I would say never use contractions in writing. They look lazy. They look like you're too lazy to spell out two full words. And if you're writing something, you've got the time to spell two words. Contractions really come from speech, right? When we say two words quickly in conversation, they start to sound like they're merged into one sound. Might have becomes might have. So contractions are fine in speech, and I definitely use them. I mean, you hear me say gotta and wanna. Those aren't words. Those are sounds. Those are the sounds of more than two words coming together. I want to. I wanna. So they're not really words. So they shouldn't be used in writing when you have the time to spell the proper word. How often do you contract? If I'm speaking, probably all the time. I tend to speak very quickly. Uh, But again, if I'm writing, I just avoid contractions altogether. Just don't use them in writing. Um, it's also for learners, it's good to spell out all the words to practice them when you're writing because if you just learn the contraction, you might not know what v means. If you're just learning English from might have, you might think it's one word and you might not have the ability to spell out the two words because you might not understand the grammar here. This is might have, right? And you should only contract when there's another verb after it, like present perfect. Might have eaten. He might have eaten the pizza. Might have eaten. Eaten is really the main verb. So you're free to contract the auxiliary verb, right? Might have eaten. But have is also a verb, right? Pen. I might have a pen. Don't contract that because we need to hear the main verb. He might have a pen. Don't say he might have a pen. 
only contract when you're dealing with, uh, when you're contracting an auxiliary like that. So how often do I do it? Yeah, often in speech. Let's see who else. Very, very kind of you. Thank you guys. Yeah, this is in debate across academia, across grammatology. This is in debate. It's always, it's always silly that we get so serious and hung up about what we call things. Now, we need to call things something so that we can talk about it. That's what words are for. But these things go into debate, and I think sometimes we get carried away. Whether something is a semimodal or a modal, who cares? What's important is that you can use it, right? So you guys are learners. It doesn't always help to know if something is a semimodal or a modal. Who cares? It works the same way. So for me, they're all modals. I just wanted to mention the term semimodal because you might see it. It doesn't matter. It just means that it's a modal, right? It still has to be followed by the base form verb. There's a couple of little twists and turns. And I'm not going to cover everything about modals today. I just want to cover the basics because the person that asked me about them is an intermediate learner and I don't want to over overwhelm the topic. There is a lot that we could talk about with modals though. Thank you very much, Sitara. That's very kind of you. Everyone is so kind. Yeah, I use the second one. I don't need to. Um, needn't to doesn't really work, but I know what you mean. Often we might say, um, you need not study, right? Or you don't need to study. You need not study. That's a bit of an awkward phrasing, need not do something. But we wouldn't use to, right? It changes. Need not do something. Need not study. That's a very old fashioned sort of phrasing. Um, especially in North America, we would normally say, I shouldn't say we, but North Americans tend to say, we don't need to do something. Not inverting it with this need not to. I would just say, I don't need to something, right? And that follows this pattern. Bob uh, does not need to pay taxes. Don't need to. And again, we need that auxiliary, do not. Um, we could say it though, we could say, Bob needn't pay taxes. It just sounds almost pretentious. It almost sounds like you're trying to be British aristocracy or something. <clears throat> In North America, we shy away from that for a lot of reasons. Um, we like to sound a little more direct, a little more egalitarian, a little more equal. Um, so, yeah, I would follow your advice and, and use the second one. Uh, Miriam's here. I wonder where Miriam's from. We use would in second conditionals and third conditionals, right? Um, Sitara, I think you might be new to Hard Boiled English Live, but we've covered conditionals a lot. But you can see here in this chart, uh, oops. Uh, second conditional and third conditional both use would. You can see that in the yellow, right? And the would expresses the unreal quality of second and third conditionals. These are conditionals that don't express reality. They express hypothetical possibilities, right? If I had a million dollars, which I don't, I would buy a Ferrari but I'm not going to because I don't have a million dollars. That's a, a dream, an imaginary possibility. Or third conditional, if I had studied more when I was young, I would be more successful today. But I was when I was young, I didn't study, so I'm not so successful today, right? That's a, that's a hypothetical past. That's a past I wish were different but I can't change it without magic, so it's unreal. The key word here with the second and third conditional is the word would, the modal would. Would expresses 
hypothetical, imaginary possibilities, including the past. Why is the past imaginary? Well, quite simply, because you can't change it. It's happened already, right? So the past is, changing the past requires magic or the imagination. All right, just reviewing the comments. Well, that's very kind of you, Suwon, thank you. Um, hopefully, make uh, uh, this is my dream, to make learning grammar enjoyable. Both learners and teachers, a lot of the time, tend to avoid grammar because they don't enjoy it. It's complicated, it's confusing, so they just avoid it. Learners avoid studying it, a lot of teachers avoid teaching it. And that's fine, every teacher enjoys different aspects of teaching. Um, and maybe they're good at different aspects of teaching. Uh, but for you guys, you learners, I want to make learning grammar enjoyable. That's why this whole mystery detective stuff is there. Because I want to show you how, you know, learning grammar isn't just following rules. It's more like solving a mystery. It's more like figuring out a puzzle. And that's kind of fun. Okay, so, well, your textbooks, uh, you need some new textbooks because could is definitely a conditional. So let's go back to that conditional chart. And I don't want to get too much time here on, spend too much time here on conditionals, but in both second and third conditionals, <clears throat> we can substitute could for would. For example, if I had a million dollars, I could buy a Ferrari. I would have the ability to buy a Ferrari. What do you need to be able to buy a Ferrari? Well, you just need money. You don't need brain power. You don't have to be smart. You can be stupid. You don't have to be nice. You can be a jerk. What you need is money, right? Or if I had studied more when I was young, I could be a doctor today, or I could have been a doctor in the past, but that didn't happen, right? To be a doctor, what do you need? What ability do you need? Well, you need to have studied a lot. You need to have done well in school. So could definitely can work in conditionals, no problem. In fact, it expresses a conditional idea. Uh, also with us is Chinu. Welcome from Oman. Great. Just trying to catch up on everyone's comments. Teacher, may I go to the bathroom? Teacher, can I go to the bathroom? So this is, and again, I don't have enough time tonight, <clears throat> my voice will dry up eventually, to go into all the uses of conditional, of modals. But here's a couple of examples of how we use it in a question, right? So if you want to form a question, you put the modal over here, right? Can Bob study in the library? Question, right? Can Bob study in the library? Um, must, must we pay taxes? Really? Must we? I don't want to. Right? That's how you make a question. So here we have two common ways to ask permission. Right? Let's imagine you're in the class. You got to go to the washroom. You put your hand up and ask the teacher. What do you say? You say, may I go to the bathroom or can I? Remember what we said about can. Can expresses ability. Well, most humans have the ability to go to the bathroom or the washroom or the restroom, whatever you call it, the toilet. You can't really survive if you don't have that ability. So let's say all of us humans have the ability. May, remember what we said about may, may or might expresses possibility. So this is asking the teacher, is it possible? So if you ask me which one's better, I would say may. May I go? Because you're asking the teacher, is it possible to go to the washroom in the context of the classroom, not in the context of your physical ability to go to the toilet, which you clearly have. However, both are used, right? Can I go to the washroom? May I go to the washroom? Both are fine. Uh, I think may sounds a little more polite uh, because it's asking directly for the possibility and you're usually asking the person who controls the possibility because the teacher can say, no, stay in the class, hold it, 
right? Uh, but both are possible. Okay. Yeah, Jack, Karen's a fascinating uh, educator. Um, I'm sure you guys would uh, have lots in common. Um, she's from the U.S. as well. Could I have a glass of water? That's another way to ask permission. Um, using the conditional could, right? Could I have a glass of water? If it's possible. If you don't mind. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. This is what teachers tell students because it's an easy way to understand it. I just don't think it's entirely honest. It doesn't really, and it doesn't really help. Um, and again, it misleads us into thinking that, that the modal expresses tense. Modals don't express tense. Verbs express tense. But when the verb can't express tense, because you're using a modal, the modal has to signal the tense. So it's not really the past of can. It's used to signal the past of the verb, right? That's a little different. I, they tell students that when they're beginners to make it simple for you to understand. It's just not entirely honest. Oh yes, Jack, please. Thank you. Uh, if you want to subscribe to the channel, guys, whichever platform you're on, the channel is the only place I keep the recordings of the shows. Uh, so use your QR code, use your phone, scan the QR code, or you can just go to the um, YouTube and put in the Grammar Detective 2, Grammar Detective 2, at Grammar Detective 2, and you'll see, um, you'll find the channel. Um, but by all means, please subscribe to the channel. And I think also, um, YouTube is probably the best place to watch the show live because the picture quality is the best. It's high definition. Sound is good. Um, and again, you can participate in the chat box. I can see who, who you are. A lot of advantages. But also, um, uh, you know, uh, you can see the recordings. Hello from Ontario. This is Sab Savbrina. I wonder if I know you, Savbrina. I know uh, Sabrina from Ontario, but hello. Welcome. Sitara says, Jack, surely everyone should subscribe to subscribe to the Grammar Detective channel. And again, if you want to do that, and I'd appreciate you doing that, you can scan right here the QR code. Um, and, you know, please, guys, share the channel with your friends. I don't know if I've said this for a while, but it's true, and I should repeat it. Um, my show is under threat. The costs of producing this show every week for an audience uh, have gone up a lot. And you might be surprised to learn this show costs me money. It costs me a lot of money to produce every week. I have different software applications and platforms that I use to stream the show. Uh, there's a lot of expenses involved. And they're going up. And I may not be able to continue with this show. But if you share the show with your network and on social media with your friends and we get more viewers, there's a greater possibility I can continue the show. So there are a few things I, I would say about that. One, if you want to support the show financially, you can make contributions on the Patreon page. When I say contributions, I mean you can, you can donate a $1, and that helps cover the cost of the show. You can also join my private members club, and there are different membership donations and subscriptions available there. I'm just starting to build this, so its capabilities are, st are just growing. But eventually all of my materials will be here, resources, live streams, uh, Zoom meetings. They'll all be here on the Members Club. And you can join for free, or you can pay and get different um, access to different features. 
Uh, but the main thing is subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already and share it with your friends. Tell them all about it. The more people we get watching this show, the more chance I have of being able to continue with it. Okay, so they say sharing is caring and in terms of social media, it's true. Yeah, good, Marta. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, it's possible, right? It's just an awkward structure. Maybe at one time in history, it was perfectly normal. Everyone said it, but... And uh, maybe you can see this when you watch um, old British or British shows about earlier times in history, like... Um, what's that show called? Downton Abbey. You might hear characters saying that because they're... <coughs> excuse me portraying a time in the language that has passed. You know, English language has changed a lot over time. Uh, but if you want to speak to Canadians like me or Americans like Jack and Karen, we probably don't say needn't. It sounds a bit awkward. Nothing wrong with the grammar, it's just uh, a conventionally unused expression. We have Heather Sisto with us. I am learning to build better confidence in live chat room too. Thank you for today's communications. Well, thank you, Heather. Uh, I'm curious, <clears throat> Heather, where are you watching from? I don't think I've noticed you before. Usually learners get bored during taking grammar lectures, lectures from their teachers, but your way of teaching is enjoyable. For thank you very much. That's very kind. Grammar doesn't have to be boring, right? It should be interesting. Um, you ever seen those movies where the spy agency uh, tries to uncode something like in the war, the British were building a computer to figure out the Nazi Germans' secret codes. For me, that's what grammar is like. It's like figuring out a secret code. And once you know the code, you can communicate better. You can communicate with better proficiency. A lot of students say, oh, I want to be fluent. Fluency is one thing. Fluency is the ability to produce language, to speak freely or to write freely. But it doesn't mean what you produce is accurate or clear or have any meaning at all. I've met students who could produce lots of language, very fluent, but what they said was nonsense because their grammar was terrible. So fluency is the ability to produce lots and fast and easily. It doesn't necessarily mean what you produce is clear English. For that, you need grammar. You need clear grammar. You need good word choice. And all of that adds up to something we call proficiency. In my opinion, proficiency is a better goal than fluency. Right? Proficiency means you can produce language that makes sense. That's a better goal. Oh, we have with us Mr. I'm not sure, even sure how to pronounce this. Oter, Oter, Oter. This is the first time I've seen you in the live chat. Very glad to see you, Teacher Paul. Very glad to see you. Thank you for joining us. I'm not sure what time it is where you are, but I'm glad you finally were able to join. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's probably a good time for me to say good night. My voice is starting to crack and hurt. Um, we've covered a lot of material here with modals. If you have other questions about modals, we can certainly continue the conversation in the future. Again, um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. Just scan the QR code um, or go to The Grammar Detective 2 on YouTube. Either way. Um, there's a topic that somebody asked me about last week, the various uses of so. Don't have time to cover that this evening, but I will cover that next week. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a good time to go. Um, so that's a topic we'll cover next week. But also if you have questions, other questions, we can certainly talk about that. So please connect with me on social media, my WhatsApp group. Um, you can find all the links for those down below in the description. Hopefully you'll connect, share the YouTube channel with all your friends. Let's get everyone involved here. 
on Hard Bold English Live. Let's increase our audience. Let's share our passion for grammar and convince other people that grammar can be fun, right? Wow, Jack, from you, that's high praise. I really appreciate that. Um, I really do appreciate that. It means a lot to me because I, you know, I, I put a lot of effort into building this show over the last few years and the audience has changed. Some people have come and gone and I worry that it's no longer helpful or useful to people. Um, so <clears throat> it's easy to be discouraged sometimes. Uh, you know, my YouTube channel is small. I've had to rebuild it. Uh, I don't have a million subscribers. And sometimes I've seen people be uh, on social media or YouTube with millions of followers, maybe not giving the best learning advice to students out there. I'm not talking about present company. Obviously, Jack, you're doing a great, you do great work. Uh, but there are a lot of people out there that um, have a great following for different reasons. Maybe not reasons because their educational material is good, but because they're charismatic or nice to look at. A lot of reasons why people get popular on social media. My viewership is small. You guys are lovely. Grammar Gumshoe is dedicated to this channel. I really appreciate it. Um, but it would be nice if more people... Uh, uh, could join. So I appreciate you saying that, Jack, and I uh, appreciate any sharing you can do. Live show happens every, once every week. Yeah, same day. It's been Friday for the last three years. Originally, I did it on Thursday because my wife helped me with the show and she had Thursdays off, <clears throat> but it became inconvenient for her. Um... Uh, okay, great. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Oh, someone's joining us now. Tayab just joined us from India. Thank you, Tayab, but we're just about to finish the show. So it's a bit late. Um, 5 p.m. Pacific time, right? I'm on the west coast of Canada, same time as Seattle, Los Angeles, <coughs> uh, Mexico City. No, I think it's off a couple of hours. That's very kind of you to say. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for watching. But guys, my voice is about to die, so I'm going to say good night. Uh, thank you all for joining me tonight. It's been great having you with me. Um, keep learning your grammar. Keep thinking of questions, right? When you're uh, studying or reading or listening or watching movies and you see something you don't understand, make a note and let's talk about it on the show, okay? That's what Hard Boiled English is all about. Um, so guys, until I see you again next time, keep learning, okay? Keep finding those English mysteries. They're out there. They're everywhere, all right? Until I see you next time, guys, stay healthy. Keep learning. And as always, stay cool. Watching tonight's show. If you have an English grammar question, an English mystery, contact me on social media and send me a video of you asking the question. I'll investigate it on a future show. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell button to get all the updates about videos and events. If you're feeling generous, you can also donate to the production costs of the show at Patreon or buy me a coffee. Finally, until the next time I see you on Hard Boiled English Live, I want you to keep learning English. Stay healthy and stay cool.